Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick. Uh, I'm a PM at Asana. Uh, been there for about two years. Before that, I worked as a PM at Yammer. I worked with Neil. Um, and I had started a SaaS software company. That's how I got into the PM space, realized how much I didn't know and how much I needed to learn before I ever tried to build something again. Um, and that led me down the path of product management. Um, and this is Neil. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so I'm on the product team at Patreon. Uh, I've been there about a year, and before that, I worked on the product team at Yammer for about five years. Again, how we met, uh, and yeah, I'm working on stuff at Patreon, like the reward system that uh, creators that use that product can use to uh, incentivize their patrons to like join and also stay pledged to them, so that they can make money uh, as an artist. Well, so welcome to our product teardown workshop. Um, so this is a process that Neil and I have used. So when we were PMs at Yammer, we often held uh, product teardown workshops among our team. And it's a process basically just to go through apps and learn from other products uh, that are out in the world. Um, we're really excited to bring this to product school. We actually brought it to the Mountain View campus last year. Um, and I thought it went well. So we're here in SF. All right, so why do we do these product teardowns? Um, the way to get great as a product manager is to constantly ship stuff, learn from your wins and losses, but that takes a long time. So how do you get better quickly? Uh, one thing we can do is learn from other products. Obviously, we won't know exactly why things were built, whether an A-B test won or lost, what the metrics lo uh, looked like, but we can make some assumptions about uh, goals and hypotheses that were made and start learning from other products. Um, we can also kind of learn to appreciate new trends and pick up design patterns. So by looking at all these other apps and products, you start building a library in your head of what are potential solutions to different problems. Um, and then finally, uh, we think it's fun. Uh, you know, hopefully you want to become a PM or you are a PM because you really like products. So it's really Cool, like to open up an app like House Party when you're in your mid 30s and be like, what are the kids doing these days? And uh, so, like, that's a really fun part of doing product teardowns, trying to understand why are apps popular, why are they catching on. Well, so today we're going to tear down two apps. Uh, we're going to compare uh, Caviar, which is owned by Square, and Uber Eats. Um, we chose these apps because. The food delivery space is really interesting. It's been, there's been lots of consolidation. And then we're also seeing a lot of the large uh, tech players like Amazon with Amazon restaurants get into the space. Um, and it's also really helpful to compare two apps so we can look at similar apps and see how they have different product strategies and the choices they're making and make some uh, assumptions about why. Um, you know, I think also Caviar and Uber Eats specifically have their own drivers, so we're not going to have to make um, different discussions based on business model, like if you looked at things like E24 that kind of tap into different driver pools. Um, and finally, you know, it's interesting that they're both part of larger tech companies, and you know, Uber has a very, very different business model and strategy than Square. Um, and that drives kind of why they, you know, why these apps exist and the product choices they're making. Um, so when we're tearing down products, uh, we need to think about these broader business goals and the strategy of the products and how that affects, you know, all, all the product decisions that are be being made. Um, as we're going through this, we should assume that the product teams at these companies are good. <laughs> um, Let's not, you know, often you run into something that seems like a bad product experience, uh, but there's probably a logical reason that it was built that way. So let's assume that. Um, and, uh, you know, we have made a bunch of assumptions because we, we don't work for Caviar Uber Eats. We don't have any insider information. So we're probably wrong about some of these, uh, some of these assumptions, but, you know, um, it's still useful uh, to make these assumptions and learn from them. Cool, so let's, let's dive into the two, uh, two apps. So pulled some uh, quotes about Caviar and their value prop, split this into how they think about their different user types, so customers, restaurants, and for the primary business. So um, for customers, Caviar, uh, Caviar says that it's an easy way to order meals from popular local restaurants across the US. 
This doesn't sound very different than probably the value prop that any one of these products would tell you. Um, to restaurants, this is a little different. Uh, Caviar is part of Square's full suite of tools for businesses, enabling restaurants across the country to reach more customers, grow their sales, and expand the reach. So you can kind of see how this would be different than what Uber would offer. Um, and then the value to Square, so I pulled this quote from uh, something that Jack Dorsey was saying, uh, that he believes caviar solves the biggest problem that every restaurant owner faces, which is physical space constraints. You just can't get more people into your restaurant, um, which they think can ultimately lead people to becoming Square customers. Uber Eats, uh, pretty different. Um, you know, they're, they're, to their consumers, Uber Eats is an easy way to get the food you love delivered. Doesn't sound very different. But um, to restaurants, again, the, the fast way to get your food, food to your customers, they're not really focused on this broader uh, service uh, that they can provide to restaurants. And then to Uber, um, I say Uber has a network of more than 2 million drivers who can also deliver food. So they're, their focus and one of their differentiators is they actually don't have to worry about the supply side of drivers the way uh, Caviar does. And this leads to some, you'll, you'll see as we go through this, some pretty different product choices um, and probably some uh, pretty different strategy choices. Cool. Um, so let's jump into the exercise. All right. Great. Thank you, Nick. OK, so we are going to do an exercise. Uh, that means the rest of this, after this part of the presentation, is going to be interactive. We're not going to be up here talking. You're going to be getting together into groups and doing stuff, like actually uh, like having product conversations and trying to come up with uh, something in the end. And that's what I'm going to describe right now. So imagine you're on the Caviar exec team, and you see a chart like this, which is actually a chart that we found online. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, right, it must be true. Uh, it's daily active users, it's not revenue or anything like that, but still, this seems troubling. And I would expect, as a PM of Caviar, when the leadership team realizes that this is happening, or something like this is happening, for them to come to me with some problems that they think are causing this, that if uh, I come up with some solutions for, that you know, we, we might be able to uh, fix the situation, or make it better at least. So uh, we have like three versions of what the Caviar exec team might bring to me as a, a problem that they want me to offer or think of solutions for. So the first one is about uh, the sign up and the checkout flow. Uh, Uber Eats is just way more frictionless, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, and this executive maybe thinks that this is what's causing uh, the like, problems for us when we compete against Caviar in the marketplace. Uh, the second one is the executive thinks that uh, like Uber Eats is stealing our low-end consumers, uh, but our high-end consumers less so. So they've done like a segmentation analysis or something like that. So what should we do? Uh, and then the third prompt is Uber Eats is now getting just as good at helping consumers discover new restaurants to try. Uh, as we are, and that was like something we used to be the best in the business at. Uh, so oftentimes in this scenario, in reality, I think PMs can play a role in calming down leadership and preventing the company from overreacting to competitive pressure. But for the sake of the exercise, let's say that our instinct as PMs at Caviar is we should do something. So let's think of things that we could do. Question. It could. It could be a different thing. <laughs> well, in this exercise, like, okay, one of the questions that you could, or one of the things that you could present is, here is some, here's some stuff I would research, either by looking at these specific metrics of our existing users and customers, uh, or by doing some kind of qualitative method or something like that to try to learn this. You could also state assumptions like that, that oh, we learned this, and this allowed us to, this like made us lean toward this solution. So uh, yeah, that, I think that's fine. So uh, I, I included in this deck kind of a problems first type of framework to approach these problems with, with some like leading questions to ask yourselves that might help you develop opinions about what options are good options and what options might not be as, uh, as good. Uh, you can use whatever framework you want if you prefer or see an opportunity to use like the Nereal hooked framework or like the startup metrics for pirates framework or whatever your preferred 
uh, thing that you want to try is, you can go ahead and try to use that. Uh, I think this could be like a useful way to start, though, to get organized. Uh, we'll, we'll okay. Pass out yep. Some mm -hmm. paper copies right. around the room, so you can look through this while you're going through it. Uh, right. So then the outcome of this exercise is to look at the products themselves and then come up with a few options to present to the rest of us, uh, like the entire room, as if we were caviar execs. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail there before that. So you've all installed the apps, I hope. Install caviar and install Uber Eats if you haven't already. Uh, best if you don't go through the sign-up flow until you're like in critical thinking mode. But uh, if you already have, it's okay. And, uh, but we're still going to like prime you a little bit and go through some of the things that we thought were interesting when we went through uh, similar places in these two apps. We actually both ordered last weekend, uh, Nick from Caviar, me from Uber Eats, or me from Caviar, Nick from Uber Eats, and we both randomly chose Burma Superstar. So it's like, it was not planned. Uh, so we thought that it was kind of interesting in onboarding uh, that uh, Caviar doesn't have any kind of like login with Facebook or any other third-party SSO option. Uh, and we also thought it was interesting when onboarding into Uber Eats that we already had the Uber app, so the Uber Eats app already knew who we were, so we didn't have to do any kind of like email verification at all. We just had to say, yep, that's who I am, and then went into the app. Uh, Caviar Payment is kind of a similar situation where uh, Caviar does support Apple Pay in addition to manually entering, entering credit card, which is not pictured. But Uber Eats has the advantage of having your credit card already. Uh, so again, like less friction. So that's like very relevant to the first prompt and possibly others. Uh, okay, and then when you go to, uh, okay, so this is the Uber Eats screenshot where it already has your credit card. Uh, when you look at the fees that Caviar and Uber Eats charge, Caviar charged me $24 on a $98 bill. And Caviar charged Nick, or sorry, Uber Eats charged Nick $5 on an $89 bill. So there's a significant fee difference. Caviar also has the fees split into two, two types of fees. So uh, we thought that was interesting. Uh, when you look at the categories, they have some categories in common, and they clearly have some exclusive deals with restaurants. Uh, the Caviar on the left has an actu actually has an exclusive by Caviar category in the app where they're calling out some like, pretty nice, like $2 sign and above, fancy sit-down restaurants that you can order from, whereas Uber's exclusive deals for Uber Eats seem to be like low-end, uh, like mainstream franchises like McDonald's. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> and then Caviar's home feed, uh, the, the home feeds look visually pretty similar, but we thought it was interesting that uh, Caviar mixed a bunch of different like pitches in their home feed, like uh, you know, delivery in under 30 minutes with Chinese in the same feed. Uh, whereas Uber Eats, what we thought was interesting here is that when Nick opened this app after ordering from Burma Superstar, his like second or third module in the home feed was maybe you want some more Burmese food. Uh, and it also didn't include as much like type by type, food type by food type modules, but it did include like restaurant specific modules in the feed. Uh, okay, so. At this point, uh, we're about to jump into the exercise. So we're going to leave this slide up so the, uh, the groups that are focusing on a single prompt like, can see the prompt. Cool. So this is, again, this is prompt one. Uh, the executive says, Uber Eats is beating us on sign up and checkout friction. What should we do? OK. So we came up with a couple ideas. We'll share. I mean, we looked at both apps. And some of the things that we noticed, way. some yeah. of the things that we noticed is that with Caviar, it's probably a little bit more frustrating to sign up with than Uber. Uh, you have to create an account, input your address after choosing a share location, mm -hmm. uh, and then you have to manually input your credit card information. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no, no kind of quick options like taking a picture of your credit card. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas Uber Eats, somewhat easier to sign up, especially if you have an Uber account already. Mm -hmm. uh, you set up your Uber, if you put input your Uber account, um, you basically have all your credit card info already stored and it's ready to go. You can literally swipe something and have it ordered in two minutes or less. Okay, so, so I heard one option in there potentially and that's the credit card photo thing. Yeah, so uh, the, the things that we yeah. thought about in terms of like, uh, you know, the, the question is how do we reduce the sign up checkout friction? Uh, things that we looked at are, you know, number one, I think you had already kind of gave us like the softball and said <laughs> Facebook sign up. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we also like the idea of uh, guest checkout. Mm -hmm. 
We also liked, uh, you know, maybe options of uh, other payments for like, say like Venmo, Venmo, uh, you know, taking a picture of your credit card, uh, even allow grass browsing to make, you know, ensure that people even just want to find the food that interests them. You know, really we should drive account sign up times under two minutes. Okay, so I'm going to kick it to the, uh, I'm going to ask the first question and then kick it out here. So why do you think they don't have uh, those other payment options? It seems obvious, right? Like PayPal, Venmo, et cetera. Like a lot of other sites have it. Why do you think they have chosen not to, assuming that's a conscious choice? I really theories? couldn't okay. answer that and why, they, why you wouldn't want to make things easy. Yeah. I mean, okay. When I think about it conceptually, why do I use food apps? Uh, it's usually a situation maybe I'm working late mm -hmm. or I'm coming home from work and I'm just really, really tired and I just want food quick mm -hmm. and I want it to happen now. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to be able to, yeah, it's almost like the Steve Jobs uh, rule where he said he wanted everything in the iPhone to be accessible in like, say, three clicks or less. Mm -hmm. And cool. I think that's really the way it should be with eating apps. All right, first question. Okay, so I'm a member of the, um, the Square Weekly team or the Caviar Weekly team. Okay, um, yes. Well, yeah, and so wait, in real life or are you, know, you <laughs> pretending? <Okay. laughs> that was going to be super awkward. <laughs> oh, you, she's going to get really frustrated today. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we've recently just been acquired by them, but like, couldn't we integrate with them as like our? Um, I would agree completely. I mean, I already have a Square account that I've used for other things, and you know that'd be a perfect way. So why do you, why do you think we haven't done that yet? I don't know. I've looked at this a total of ten minutes. <laughs> okay. okay. Next question I was over here. I thought I saw one. Okay, no, I saw one just here, ma'am. Oh. I mean, I'm sure this is probably on the okay. agenda. Oh, but there's one. Integrations yeah. take time. The Facebook sign account? Uh, you know, many other op apps out on the market I'll allow you the option mm -hmm. to sign up via your Facebook account where you can have your details already loaded into the new mm -hmm. application. Yeah, so there's like friction, like lower friction, but then maybe is there anything we could do with that data, like who the friends of the person are or whatever else Facebook? Absolutely, you can person? start. Yeah, I mean, Dan likes Uber, you know, caviar, you know, and all of a sudden that starts appearing in okay. friends feeds as well. Yeah. Cool. Okay, last question. It sounds like the big issue is the credit card, though. I think if you integrate with Facebook, it's a good idea to get the account created, but I don't think Facebook stores your credit card data. At least I don't think you. I think I've ever put a credit card associated with my Facebook it's not ID. Not common. Yeah. yeah. But with your ID for for Apple. Um, which does have credit card data for mm -hmm. all their iPhone. Yeah, Apple iPhones. Pay. I mean, right. you need to offer different right. payment, payment options. options and right. it need, like I said, you the goal, you can you do many different options, but really you want to drive your sign-up time right. like under two minutes. Right. I mean, you want someone that already starting to look for their food right. within, within is, under if two if minutes. the credit card is a big issue, somebody that already has a credit card data. Mm -hmm. But the other part we found out, you know, found frustrating is not only can you say share my location with the app, but then you still have to put in an address of where you want it delivered. Hmm. Cool. Uh, well, and if you're working at like a business location, you might not know the exact address off the top of your head. Mm -hmm. It just adds like small little frustrations <clears throat> that make you say, I'm just going to go with the Uber Eats. Oh, thanks for volunteering. What was your name? Dan. Dan. Thanks, Dan. All right. <laughs> All right. We're going to go one, two, three, one, two, three until we're out of time. Right. Okay. So we need a volunteer from the two group. All right. First hand. Come on up. All right, so the prompt again is Uber Eats is stealing our low-end consumers. What should we do? <laughs> so our team back there, uh, we're trying to solve the problem to incentivize low-end customers. So we're thinking about the total cost of the caviar purchase. So that includes from delivery to the items for each entree. So we try to solve that by when you open up the app, we provide you with a list of restaurants offering free delivery. And how we do that without burning all our VC cash or like Square's money <laughs> is by uh, kind of reverse surge pricing. So when a lot of people are ordering from the same restaurants, we can optimize those driver routes uh, to deliver it to you cheaper. And so that's why the curated the list at the top that offer free delivery are from popular restaurants. Uh, so that's the idea of how we can lower the cost. All right. So next uh, first question. Jack Dorsey here. Uh, question. <laughs> uh, Hi, Jack. So. You know, Square's business is retaining restaurants. We don't actually want low-end customers. Why would we focus on meeting their needs? Uh, that's, that's a, great a really question. hard question. <laughs> 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 another, 
another exec told us. You broke the prompt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your CFO <laughs> said they wanted more low end customers. Uh, you know what so I think it's like just prompted. He said they are stealing our low end customers, which we do. And I think part of the question is should we go after those low end customers or not? Uh, well, what do you think? What's your gut? Should they? Uh, yes, I do think so. All right. Uh, <laughs> because it's a, like an on ramp to future. Like, it's a very large market uh, that we can satisfy with this solution. Uh, so I think it's something that we should do. Cool. Great. Okay. Question there. He's from uh, Oh yeah, yeah. We have an answer from the crowd. I think the bigger question is uh, they might be lowering customers today, and they might be students today. The question: Do you want them to be your customers when they graduate, when they actually go get a job, right? So definitely, that's something that you should look at. And I'm sure there's a market research firm that has told you that Uber Eats is, is stealing your customers, but the first question would be, do you want to go after them? And second would be, if they are students, we do want to go after them, and you know, because tomorrow they are going to be hiding lives after lives. That's what I'm saying. All right, great. Okay, another question. Sorry. Oh, go for it. Another answer. Kunal, hello. <laughs> Mm. So see if it's worth it. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Jack's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> have you guys have caveat considered adding uh, ratings? That seems to be something very easy to find in Uber, and that may be the reason why the higher end customer is willing to pay a little more because they're more quality. Hmm. What do you think? Uh, we're targeting low end customers. Mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a great idea for high end customers. Actually, well, if you want to change your. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we time for one more question for this one. The, the feature was uh, like higher volume consolidating orders into the like same rides, basically, yeah, right? And then offering yeah. free, free delivery yeah. for those. Yeah, and free delivery for those. Thoughts? Okay, quiet group. Okay. There should be like, what is it called, Uber Express? There should be the opposite, where it takes longer, but you pay less for delivery. Mmm, wow. <laughs> what do you think of that one? That's a good idea, yeah. Okay, so then final challenge. Like, if you had to choose between your feature and that feature, how would you choose? Between delaying orders and, yeah, slow orders that are cheaper or consolidating orders. Uh, all right, settle, please, settle, settle. So we thought about that idea where if you scheduled your delivery four hours ahead, then we can consolidate mm -hmm. orders. But when you think of when you want to order something, it's like that sudden urge of like hunger. Like you see a tasty video on your Facebook feed and it's like 7 p.m. Mm. and you're hungry. You want it now. And so you don't want to wait. Uh, it's not something that you're willing to like wait an hour or two. So you, you don't think users would use it? Uh, less yeah. likely, That's yeah. Because when you're hungry, you're reason hungry. not to build something usually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great. And what's your name? Eric. Eric, yeah. thanks so much for volunteering. Thanks. All right, group three, discovery. As a reminder, there we go. Prompt, uh, Uber Eats is now, uh, is now just as good at getting customers to discover new restaurants. What should we do? <clears throat> Here, I'll hold it for you. All right, so we kind of tried to break the question a little bit. So maybe discovery isn't the problem. So forcing discovery. Impossible, says the executive. Forcing, to, <laughs> forcing discovery potentially inhibits the consumer experience by increasing search time duration. Lower mm. discovery as a priority, focus on speed and ease of navigation, uh, and discovery could be a byproduct. In other words, okay. make it easier for people to find what they want rather than trying to force discovery. OK. Nick, do you have a first question for this one? It's your turn. OK. Uh, <laughs> Let me try to figure out how to push back. So basically, you're defining discovery as like, is it like the algorithm that you use and the groupings that you surface? Or uh, like, what do you mean by like navigation instead of discovery? So discovery is kind of a, a coincidental byproduct of someone just going into an app and finding mm -hmm. out that they want something. OK. Like, yeah. I want Thai food today. I go and find Thai food. I want Chinese food tomorrow. The app didn't. Well, maybe it helped me discover it, but mm -hmm. nothing about the app is yeah. trying to tell me to discover it. Okay. I just knew what I wanted, and I got it. And in okay. a way, I discovered it. 
So then you must, your hypothesis must be user, most consumers come into the app with intent, like at least enough intent to be like food type specific. Right. Right? Uh, okay. I'm just thinking in terms of myself, that's how I think. Okay. Uh, question from the crowd, yeah. I'm hungry, but I don't know what I want. <laughs> So, and then this is where we took out the two different apps, and then we looked at the feed. Mm -hmm. And actually, most of them disagreed with me. But what I really liked about it, <laughs> This is who you sent? No. But, <laughs> what I really liked about Uber is that it listed pizza, Vietnamese, Thai, Chinese, and it was just um, so the two boxes lined up next to each other. It was a lot of options, really quick and easy to see. While in Caviar, it was one option, and also it might say Indian food. And then it said maybe price point, cost of delivery, and duration. And it was just too much information. Well, I was just thinking, I want this category of food, and I'll worry about price, I'll worry about cost, I'll worry about all those things. So you're saying there's a trade-off between prioritizing discovery and helping people who know what they want find it fast. Hmm. I would say Other questions? For, yep. for discovery, you guys evaluated like, um, the, the, so the, ur the urgency of the consumer might be also have a budgetary restriction. Like, so my, my budget is 10 bucks. And like, if I find something under 10 bucks, like right there, I, I might be just purchasing whatever it is. Like, Next. You know? So, I mean, do you guys evaluate that as part of the discovery? Like the, the price as, as the, not, not, not so much like the type of food or location, but price. Did we talk about that one? Uh, I just wanted to like, oh. Yeah. How, how long? How long before Soylent is on the Uber Eats feed at the top, right? Yeah. I was thinking overall simplifying the feed. Get someone to the type of food that they want and they can worry about price later. Also, the type of food mm -hmm. that they want is probably going to correlate to price most of the time. I think I mean, price is important no matter what kind of a customer you are. This is the information you have to show up. OK, last question on this one. So yeah, the so discovering restaurants is probably should have included that word in the prompt in hindsight, uh, <laughs> right within the app. So it kind of like the you must believe in order to believe this problem is important, you must believe that there are enough consumers who come in with not with low intent, uh, other than just getting food to make it worth investing more in discovery. And uh, in my opinion, like I talked to some groups about this, like because Caviar is owned by Square, there may be another strategic component to consider where. Uh, caviar is a selling point to for salespeople that want to get caviar or get square terminals into new restaurants, saying like we'll bring you this volume, but that selling point won't work if 
they, if that restaurant is not very well known and they're like optimizing their discovery feed for like just general uh, order volume. Like if they, if that's their goal, then they need a different type of discovery food than Uber Eats probably needs. They need to be like suggesting restaurants that aren't getting enough love so that they can retain those customers as square customers. So that's one thought I had, but I tried to leave it open-ended just, you know, or we did. That's very on strategy for the Jack quote, Jack Dorsey quote that Nick presented for sure. Uh, okay, we got to move on though. We got to move on. Uh, we're going to go back to a one. I want to give another. Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry. What was your name? Keith. Keith. Thank you. All right, let's get a one volunteer. And we've had three men in a row, so I'd love to get some diversity if possible. Uh, okay. Uh, and somebody who wants to though. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, flow was so frictionless, we had an accidental McDonald's order. Did anyone have an accidental caviar order? No. That's interesting. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll hold it for you. Oh. Yeah. Hi, I'm Diana. Hi, um, Diana. Hi. I think the first thing that we wanted to do, which we don't have the information on, is really look into the analytics and see where people really are dropping off so that we can kind of focus our attention. So mm -hmm. is it really in the sign up flow or is it in the checkout flow? So first thing, if it is in sign up, I think we've covered it a lot, but really trying to cut down on the number of required steps. So mm -hmm. one, either it is doing some sort of social sign in, mm -hmm. um, or maybe you don't even require some of those steps until mm -hmm. You're paying. Like, do we need mm -hmm. your credit card information right now? Maybe you need to explore and see that you really like what's mm -hmm. on Caviar, and then you put it in later, and then you can save it at that mm -hmm. point. So at least you're in. Because we, if you look that and see when people are in, then they're actually ordering. Then mm -hmm. it's like we need to get over that hurdle. Mm -hmm. If it's the actual checkout process, then we thought um, when we're looking at the fees, there were just there was like. Uh, some like health fee, there's a service fee, there's a delivery fee. Mm -hmm. And even though some of them are free, it's just a lot. Um, <laughs> and Uber Eats just had one flat fee. Mm -hmm. So even if we combine those fees into one, then maybe it wasn't like, feel like we're paying more. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if they're the same amount, it seemed like maybe mm -hmm. Caviar is um, charging more for fees. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a mm -hmm. reason to drop off. Hmm. So. Let's say that we can't do much about the fees. We need it for our business yeah. to be profitable, although it's probably not. Uh, and so that's not an option. But uh, did you happen to notice like whether you see? So if you didn't put your credit card in at the beginning, yeah. you can like get you can add stuff to your card. You can get there without putting your credit card in if you want. Uh, but then you have to put your credit card in. Yeah. Did you notice whether you could see the fees when you were prompted to put your credit card in, or whether they left it until afterward? And if you if you didn't notice that like what do you think they should do there for people who are entering their credit card at the end of their first order? Um, for me, I had Apple Pay, so it already connected it to Apple Pay. Oh. And I'm actually not used to seeing Apple Pay as a connected um, payment type. So mm -hmm. when I clicked it, I wasn't even sure that it was connected or just mm -hmm. telling me that Apple Pay was an option. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you had uh, joined with, without a credit card, right? And it prompted you with credit card information. So I don't know if you remember seeing the <coughs> fees. But I think the payment information is on the bottom. So I think you would mm -hmm. see all the fees first. Hmm. But we were just saying to combine the three fees into one line item. So a small change yeah. that maybe you could, there could be a question mark and you like there's a hop up and then you can see mm -hmm. the fees, but just making it seem like there's a fee versus three fees. It seems like an interesting way to start the conversation with the lawyer at <laughs> the caviar. It could yeah. be like, yeah. Sure. Uh, well, okay. Uber Eats doesn't have to do it. Right, true. Uh, they're not known for following laws, though. So, <laughs> right? Too, too soon. Okay. Uh, okay. Questions from the crowd. Questions about uh, yeah, when when to put in payment method. Yeah, I guess an open-ended question. Why do they have Apple Pay and no other payment types, other than manual credit card, for you or for anyone? Did anyone sign up on Android? Does anyone have an Android? Yeah. I assume it's not. I mean, it wouldn't be Apple. 
Okay. Okay. Questions for this one? Yeah. Might be more feed, too much fees or something. Okay. Oh, there, there was a question? Oh. Yes, question. Mm, like using a square uh, piece of hardware. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, they didn't have that as an option. No, I mean, I don't, I don't want that friction at all of adding my credit card. It's only like mm -hmm. many a times when we order food from office, it's office credit card. And we don't want to put that card on the side anyway. <coughs> and if it's something like swiping the card, it's easier. Mm -hmm. But I don't even think that adding credit cards now on a, a mobile phone is so normal. Like for me, that's not a barrier. It's more like mm -hmm. when we got into Caviar, there was just so much information. It's like, mm -hmm. do I even want to go through? I can't find what I want to order when I get to the page there's too much information mm -hmm. and yeah we when we were on uber we we like checked out by accident because it was so easy so I think <laughs> there's something to that where maybe there's just too many steps because my yeah. credit card information was in um, caviar but I still mm -hmm. didn't check out on accident so I, it's funny that you accidentally checked out but like how did uber do that was it like tricky and do you feel like they got you or something or yeah i mean they're known to be right so <laughs> do they have a pattern in there no that, okay it's just like it's major selections and then it's like as simple as tough. so you're just used to it being too hard yeah okay So there's no confirmation. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Could you cancel? Yeah. I had a hard time canceling. Oh, difficult cancellation flow. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the question. I'm like uh, head of user operations. We get all these people that are upset that they're ordering. Should we add a confirmation step to the caviar mm. sign up flow and add me? No, or Uber, yeah. Uber, right? To, yeah, uh, well, Uber Eats. Yeah. Well, this is for caviar. Okay, no, sure, sure. We don't yeah. have confirmation either, right? Sure. Let's say we we have the same feedback. Should we address that problem or not and ignore the users and keep the orders? <laughs> Sorry, I'll I'll speak I, up. Sorry. I would. Sorry, the the question is. Uh, should we add, so users are writing in and our customer support is telling us they're unhappy about accidentally placing orders, should we add a confirmation step is the question. I mean, it seems like at that point you're actually getting people through the process, which is great, because um, mm -hmm. we're not even at that step yet, so maybe that means you've done something good. Mm -hmm. Are there any maybe, oh, yeah? So adding cancel with grace period instead of uh, the yes, no. Why is that? We've already done that with your friends doing well. It's just okay. satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So you think that's just also just like a nicer user experience? Uh, okay. Yeah? I have to report, like, this is short term revenue, like, there's a minute. What do you think Uber's board would say? <laughs> or, I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Uh, cool. Yep. Yeah, I have a question. So, mm -hmm. assuming you can only optimize the credit card capture so much, mm -hmm. and it has to exist, how do you tell when is the best time to force the user to enter, whether it's on registration or when they're about to buy something? You want to take this one? A/B testing. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. Then they rate it or something. Uh, so your question is. Uh, let's say you have the choice between prompting uh, for credit card information during the sign-up flow or prompting for credit card information in the checkout flow the first time when you don't have it uh, for caviar. So, and uh, the the answer here is like A/B testing. Do you want to like I can I can elaborate on that if you don't want to, but if you have a, like an A/B test design in mind, maybe you could say it. Um, I mean, I guess you could see what the drop-off is if you have checkout. Mm -hmm. 
if you have the credit card information in sign up versus when you don't and see if there's an up if there's a huge drop off then maybe that is a problem i still don't think that adding your credit card information is a problem it's like i don't want to have to enter my email address my my address um that might be in like facebook or something else i feel like those fields cause me a lot more pain mm -hmm. and then even just having the autofill mm -hmm. that remembers from your phone or browser would be great which you didn't have mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would definitely A-B test this also. I would have the you know add credit card step if we don't have it in the checkout flow regardless because we need it there. But I would A-B test whether to put it in the signup flow. And rather than, like I would definitely look at the drop off of that step that that step is causing, but it will exist, right? Because it's one more step, it's one more place for people to drop off. But uh, companies that have written about this and in an A-B test or two in my experience uh, have noticed that when you put a frictiony step in signup flows, uh, sometimes you filter out only low quality users that would have been worthless anyway. And you actually like improve the experience of your app even depending on the app because only high quality users that are likely to convert or post if it's a social product or whatever are getting through. So it's important with this, especially sign up flow A-B tests I think to like look at the core metrics uh, of that app like order volume or lifetime value of customer or something like that rather than just like the funnel metric. But you need to look at that too. Yeah.